Welcome to the Man Cave Podcast with Dan Casper. What's up, everybody? Welcome to this episode of the Man Cave Podcast, brought to you by hy V Toys and Ford, Residence Branding Company, the official swag provider for the program. Check out the Swag Cave peeps. Oh, man, what are we going to chat about on this episode? Hey, we're going to chat some Badgers. RJ Cardinal is going to join me and talk, talk some uh, Badger football later on in this podcast. I want to talk some Packers and wide receiving contracts and and uh is do should we play a little money ball when it comes to maybe wide receiver contracts and such because that market is exploding uh we'll talk about that coming up a little bit later on but uh, i want to lead off the podcast talking some uh milwaukee brewers uh the brewers falling last night three to one to the phillies Brewers had a chance early on in the game. Bases loaded, nobody out, and not able to manufacture any runs whatsoever uh, with with that situation. The only run coming from former Philadelphia Philly himself, Reese Hoskins, with a solo shot uh, later on in the game in the uh, in the top of the seventh. There, that was it. That was the only offense uh, for the Brewers as they. Uh, End up losing again 3-1. to one. Katie getting the initial start, the opener, pitching an inning. And then Wilson uh, coming in, pitching five and two-thirds, giving up six hits, three earned runs. And then Milner finishing off, uh, pitching one and a third. I'll be honest with you. If you would have told me that uh, you held the, the Philadelphia Phillies to just three runs and, yeah, if you held the and, – and you were doing the opener uh, situation there, I would have taken that almost any day of the week. You're doing a little bit opener. You got Wilson thrown in. That's not a knock on I'm Wilson. I'm not trying to, you know, put a knock on him or, or, or anything like that. But it's like, I, I, and then you hold the, the Philadelphia Phillies to three. I'd, I'd say you're putting yourself in a position to, to win that ball game. Now I know Zach Wheeler's uh, the other dude on the mound there, and it's going to be tough. Uh, but, I mean, when you get a chance, when you get an opportunity to put up some runs, and when you're in a situation where it's bases loaded and nobody out, you've got to be able to manufacture some runs on there. That's missed opportunities. And the Brewers missed a big one potentially there. So um, they'll try again tonight, though, but it's going to be, in, again, another uh, tough tough matchup here with Sanchez in the mound. It sounds like Koenig's going to be... Uh, the guy again getting the the fir- the opener going in the first inning or maybe you know first couple outs and 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 such. And I believe it's going to be Colin Ray after that. So Brewers electing to go with uh, with the opener approach again for the game tonight. And when we look at Sanchez, who's on the mound for uh, for the uh, for the Phillies, not a ton of experience with this Brewers lineup going up against him. Uh, it looks like he got a game's worth with some of these guys. Adamas is, you know, just three at-bats. Contreras is just three at-bats. Uh, Sanchez, three. Uh, Yelich, four. So you can't really take a, away anything. But when you look at Sanchez, this left-handed pitcher, he's three and three so far this year. An 11 game started with a 2.83 ERA. He's coming off of a win against the Giants where he went six innings, um, giving up four hits and no earned runs, striking out seven. But his two previous games are two Colorado, no decision, five and a third, one earned run, struck out a couple. Washington, no decision, went seven innings, two earned runs, struck out eight. In the let me let me kind of break it down here a little bit more. Uh in the month of May, he is he had a fantastic month of May going two and zero with a two point oh three ERA. So another test for this uh for this Brewers offense and really if this is a big game for them because I'm not saying tomorrow's going to be an automatic loss. I would never say that, but I mean you're going up against you're going up against Nola, Aaron Nola tomorrow, which is going to be an incredibly hard test for for this offense. Nola, who's seven and two with a three point oh three ERA, so got to take advantage. If you're in a situation again where you have a chance to manufacture some runs and you got bases loaded and you got nobody out and coming away with zero, that's unacceptable. That's unacceptable. Uh, But a couple of uh, news nuggets before the game yesterday. Joey Ortiz, for one, forgot to mention this, named NL Rookie of the Month for the month of May. So Joey Ortiz is your Rookie of the Month. When you look at his numbers, 
Uh, he ranked second among National League players behind some dude named Bryce Harper with a 978 OPS, slashing 307, 391, 587 with four homers. Um, Ortiz saying it's definitely not something I expected. I was just trying to do my best, do my job out there, worrying about helping the team win. That's really honestly what matters. The accolades are cool, but I just want to do what I can to put the team in a good position. So, Ortiz, I mean, that dude looking looking like he's going to be a pretty darn good ball player for the uh, for the crew here. So, But before that, uh, or I should say another news before the game, that is a pretty big downer here. Robert Gasser is getting his elbow evaluated. Um, Pat Murphy is saying he's got some tightness, some soreness in his left elbow, uh, saying they're going to take a look, making sure he's 100%. Uh, asked if it was a concern, Murphy said that everything is a concern. Um, anytime you, I hear a pitcher and it, it's elbow, I start to immediately think the worst. It's not always the case. I understand that, but it's hard not to when you think of a pitcher and, and they're throwing elbow and there's some issues going on there. There's some tightness. There's some soreness in, involved. You, you get really nervous. You get very, very nervous. So, um, now earlier he was on the injured list, um, opened up the minor league season on the injured list after dealing with some bone spurs in his elbow during spring training. So could it maybe potentially be something related to that? That, that would be, uh, I think a better case scenario than what maybe a lot of us are currently thinking right now. And that would be Tommy John. Hopefully, hopefully that's not what's going on here. But maybe we'll find out uh, a little bit more today when Pat Murphy and and such talks to the talks to the media before the uh, before the the game starts. So, but with that, with Robert Gasser, I mean, I would expect him to again, maybe depending on what what we're going here. But I'm I'm thinking let's just for for this exercise, I think he's going to miss some time, and hopefully it's not a lot. But when you look at the starters that the Brewers opened up this year with. D.L. Hall, injured list. Ross, injured list. Gasser, he might be on the injured list now. Wayne Miley, done. Done for the season. You got Colin Ray and Freddie Peralta as your still guy, original opening week, opening start of the season, you know, members of the starting rotation there. And they've had to go through some openers. They've had to convert Wilson into a starter and such. And he's done an admirable job. But there's no doubt about it. This team could probably use an influx of arms, starting arms, guys that could go out there and eat up some innings. And with a trade deadline coming up on July 30th, we've got some time for, for that. But how how much longer can the Brewers actually – kind of wait around and before they potentially make some 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 moves potentially acquire another starting pitcher because we all know when it comes to the trade deadline teams are always looking for pitchers they're always looking for pitcher pitching help and at by the time when you get to that deadline you may get a little desperate prices may go up a little bit more too but it's still Kind of early. I know I asked this yesterday. When can we stop saying it's early in Major League Baseball? Like, when can we stop saying? Is it is it the Memorial Day benchmark? We're in the beginning of June now. I think we could stop saying that it's early. But maybe for some, in, in this case, for some teams, maybe it's just a skosh too early where they want to decide whether they're going to be sellers by, by the trade deadline. Unless you're like the White Sox, which you've got no chance at, you know, making a comeback. But... I don't know, maybe like a team like the Mets, you know, are they still maybe on the fence, even though they probably should say, yeah, we're, we're, we're not doing anything this year. You know, we're, we're 10 games below 500 at this point, and heck, look at our division right now. I mean, we're 16 and a half back from Philadelphia uh, alone there. So, But I'm sure some teams are probably going to say they're not ready to, quote-unquote, sell at this point. But there's some, <clears throat> like the White Sox, who... Yeah, we all know that they're going to be sellers, and what 
does it matter if they trade their guy now as opposed to the deadline? Unless they're thinking, hey, going to hold on to this guy, going to hold on to this player because desperate times call for desperate measures, and we know the longer we hold on to them, the more anxious teams are going to be and the more that they're probably going to spend. But I also think it's we know that the Brewers are not going to go out there and probably get you know the top available pitcher on the market, whoever that may be. They're not going to go out there and get a big-time ace. You know, that, that, that's not going to happen. CC Sabathia is now walking through that door. I don't think so, at least. But I think there's a few pitchers from when I was kind of looking this up earlier this morning that just kind of fit or would be decent targets or or I, maybe ideal targets for, uh, for, for the Brewers. And I'm going to start off by, you know, maybe Matt Arnold – Given a call to his former boss for his former coworker David Stearns over there at the Mets and saying, all right, David, what's it going to take or what's the asking price for a couple of your uh, couple of your starters right now? And the, the two guys that I'm kind of paying attention to here would be Luis Severino, who signed a one-year $13 million deal in the offseason, so it's going to be a little prorated. He's going to be a free agent next year, but be a little bit prorated there. Um, so far this year, he is 3-2 and two with a 3.52 ERA. He has pitched, started in 11 games this year. You know, he's would that potentially be 30, 30 years old? Um I think that potentially could be an option. I mean, obviously, David Stearns knows uh, the you know Brewers' farm system pretty darn well. Some of the minor league systems over there. Could the Brewers potentially uh, use one of their plethora of outfielders that David Stearns had a hand in in acquiring to maybe make some of these moves? Potentially. But Severino could potentially be an option. Um, I mean, he might as well, if I'm looking at it, he doesn't have a great record this year. He's one and five with a five point one seven ERA. But you might as well knock off your, your bingo card here and, and join up with the Brewers. Was it Quintana? I mean he's played for every other team, I think, for the Central. The former Brewer killer started opening day against the Brewers. Numbers wise, do they look great? No. But you know what? Guy pitches and he goes out there and he eats innings. And really when you look at his last few games here, three earned runs, three earned runs, three earned runs, two earned runs. I mean, not awful. And I think it's, you look at the team surrounding him too. But he could could he be a guy that maybe gets you some innings? Again, these aren't going to be sexy names. And I don't think that's what the Brewers are going to do. They're not going to go out there and, and get some big-time aces out there. I just I, I, That's not what's going to happen, I don't feel like. Whether I agree with it or not, I mean, I just, I'm, I'm looking at, players here that potentially could fit a brewer's mold where they bring in and like all right finish off the year with this guy hopefully he can eat some innings and hopefully he's a guy we can rely upon and that uh you know is stays healthy for for the most part cross your fingers there but i wouldn't be surprised if matt arnold's maybe called his former buddy his former boss and said all right you know our farm system you know you know our minor league systems here what would it take to maybe take a couple of your starters off your hands? Knowing that, hey, they only signed one-year deals, short-term deals, pro-rated over there. What's it going to take? The one that may cost a little bit more here might be a guy that they just faced the other night. Eric Fetty from the Chicago White Sox. A guy that is widely expected that he could be a target. Now, I feel like he could... Maybe be a guy that's going to fetch the most amount of uh, return capital, if you will, from other teams. If other teams are are interested in acquiring him, he signed a two year, fifteen million dollar deal. So he is actually under contract for next year, but it's for seven point five million dollars. And I think if I'm the Brewers, I'm I'm okay with that. You get prorated for the rest of his salary for this year. You know, let's say in half, half of seven point five, doable, and then next year for seven point five million, I I'd take that. I mean, I don't think that's a deterrent at all. 
but he has started 12 games. He's appeared in 12 games. He has started 12 games. His most uh, recent one uh, is, is actually, you know, his most recent uh, loss here or outing, excuse me, was against the Brewers in that 12-5 to uh, game. But really when you look at his, his numbers uh, overall, and he didn't get charged with that loss. He didn't get charged with that loss. But overall, 4-1 and one with a 3.12 ERA. I think that could be an option. But I also feel like maybe one of the more expensive options in terms of what teams are willing to give up. Because you look at the contract, very doable contract. You got him under control for for next year. I think you know compared to the Quintanas and the Severinos, Fatty might cost a little bit more, a little bit more. But it's an option. It's an option. Another guy that could potentially be uh, an option here for the for the crew. Let's go to Miami because it feels like hey, you want to talk about teams that are selling? Marlins got to be a team that always sells, right? Right. So how about Jesus Lazardo? Now he's got a couple more years of arbitration. So he's under arbitration for 2025, arbitration for 2026. You'd have control uh, of him for the next couple of seasons. And so far this year, you know, two and four with a 4.18 ERA. But, you know, you look at his last outings here. He went up against Bruce. Bruce just faced him back on the uh, back on the twenty seconds, so they got to see him, and and he picked up a win. And that's when he went eight innings, three hits, zero earned runs. And you look at his games in the month of May: three earned runs in his latest game against the Padres, zero, zero, two against Philly. Again, this might be a guy because he's younger. And because he has control, he has arbitration control for the next couple of years, probably going to be a little bit more than those veterans we from, from the Mets that we just chatted about. He's 26 years old, but you would be able to have him for, for a couple of years. Would it be worth it maybe sending a couple more prospects over there? Why not? And then another name I'll throw into, into this discussion here is the, uh, the Oakland A's. The Oakland A's here, Paul Blackburn. Paul Blackburn. He is a guy that's got another year of arbitration, so you would have control over him. Uh, He is 30 years old, so he'll be 31 next year. But so far this year, he is 3-2 with a 4.11 ERA in four games played, started four of those games here too. He is dealing with... Uh, an injury right now in a walking boot was placed on a 15-day IL uh, a few days ago. So, I mean, that's something you have to, to kind of, you know, look at here and and figure out. But, you know, when you look at what he has done so far this year, and you have the control uh, over him too, could it be a possibility? Yeah, I think that's a potential. Again, a lot's going to depend on his injury. But so far this year, um, he is – You know, pitched 46 innings, started off the season on the 31st against Cleveland, going seven innings, just giving up three hits and no earned runs. So, I mean, Paul Blackburn could potentially be an option here uh, for for the A's. Like I said, 3-2 and with a 4.11 ERA. He has pitched so far in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 games. I think I said 4 earlier, but it's 8 games uh, he has pitched uh, so far this year. So those are just a few names. There, there's plenty more out there. But Luis Severino and Jose Quintana, veterans who the Mets, you know, signed for those one-year double-digit million-dollar deals this this past offseason, kind of filling in the gaps. Could that be an option where the Mets, I think, are going to be sellers? Could they get something in return for expiring contracts of these veterans? Absolutely, they probably could. Would those be options for the Brewers? Maybe. Are they sexy names? No, they're not the sexiest names out there. But they're guys that have starting experience and eat innings, which right now the Brewers need a couple of those. They, they need a few of those guys. And whether it's a positive or a negative, at least David Stearns knows about some of the prospects in the Brewer system. So maybe there's a double-A guy or a single-A guy that he really likes and he's willing you know, to send one of these veterans over for, for that guy. 
Fetty, Jesus could be the guys that maybe will be a little bit more expensive for the Brewers to try to acquire. Might have to include a little bit more top talent there. And then Paul Blackburn on there too, who you do have control for for one more year arbitration uh, eligible as well for for next year. Brewers, this is a decision that we're gonna have that they're gonna have to start to to make here, and I'm sure something that we are gonna talk about for a while. They continue to win games. They continue to have a big lead in the division. They continue their offense continues. You know, to be top five, just outside top five in a lot of categories and, and kind of leading the way. How much do you go for it? How much do you push in the chips? It, it feels weird because the last few years we've had that, that, had that discussion. But the Brewers had a good starting pitching core. Corbin, Brandon, Freddie. You know, when Wade was healthy, it was like, okay, do they go in there and try to get a bat? This year it's a little bit different where maybe we trust the offense just a little bit more. But how much do they go in for for a starting pitcher for some pitching help this year? They need it. They just need guys to stay healthy. And so that's going to be something that they're going to have to figure out. They're going to have to start talking about. And like, all right, how how much do we want to go for this? Do we trade from a position of great depth? Maybe one of their outfielders, whether it's a Weimer, Joey Weimer, or, or Gary Mitchell, or whoever. We're getting set for another busy travel season, vacations, taking our kids to all their games and activities, and you need a proper vehicle to get you to where you're going and safely. That's where Toys and Ford can help you. Toys and Ford will go the extra mile to provide you with compelling options for new and used car shopping. They will gladly work with you on financing no matter what your budget may be. They're committed to giving drivers across the Chippewa Valley the best in customer service. Check them out for yourself. Visit Toys and Ford in Chippewa Falls today and check out their website, toysandford.net. I want to talk some Packers. And yesterday, we know the the news, the big news in the NFL world was the fact that the Vikings locked up Justin Jefferson, making him the highest paid non quarterback in the entire league. And I think he's he's deserved it. Whether you think he's the best wide receiver or not, I mean, it's like any position in the NFL. Maybe Jamar Chase breaks it. Maybe Jamar Chase is going to be higher in a certain area, whether it's guaranteed or the per year, whatever the case may be, eventually there's going to be another person that leapfrogs Justin Jefferson. Okay? That's just, that that's going to happen. And I think for, from a Viking standpoint, they can do this type of deal. I know there was some talk about whether they're going to trade him and instead of pay him and that, but you know, you draft J.J. McCarthy in the first round, which is key because you have that fifth year option. Over there, too. You don't necessarily have to start J.J. McCarthy right now. They got Sam Darnold over there. And we'll see how that all plays out. But it lines up where a four-year deal for Justin Jefferson, it lines up with J.J. McCarthy's rookie deal. Okay, so that makes sense. You, you, you can do that. But there's certain teams right now, Dallas potentially being one of them, if they decide to keep on Dak Prescott and they give him a new deal and then you, know, you sign up C.D. Lamb to a massive deal, that's a ton of money ton of money wrapped up into two players for your salary cap. Bengals could be in the same situation with Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase, and then they got T. Higgins over there too. They could be in a similar situation. Green Bay has been in a similar situation that where they were paying a quarterback and they were paying a lot for, for their receiver. So teams are in that situation. Look at the Dolphins, for crying out loud. they got a lot of money invested in you know wide receivers. Heck, even Philly. They, they gave Jalen Hurts a big-time deal, and they got A.J. Brown. And Devontae Smith under big time contracts. But a narrative that I started to see a little bit yesterday on on social media, and it's related to to the Packers, is could we see some teams kind of employ, if you will, a quote unquote money ball type of situation when it comes to, to wide receivers? Meaning that maybe they're not gonna, you know, give because the wide receiver market has absolutely exploded this off season. Exploded. Could we see some teams, maybe kind of similar to how some teams do it with running backs, where they kind of shuffle in new guys every couple of years, every few years, and then you know maybe they'll they'll bring in a veteran for a year or two under a cheaper deal. Could we see some teams start to do that with? 
the wide receiver group. And when you look at Green Bay, I mean, you got Christian Watson and Romeo Dobbs as your your veterans who are entering their third years. They're under rookie deals. Jane Reed's on his rookie deal. Don Tavian Wicks is on his rookie deal. You want to throw in a tight ends? Luke Musgrave, Tucker Craft entering their second years. They're all under rookie deals. Chiefs are a little bit similar in that too. You know, yes, they got Travis Kelsey, highest paid tight end, but wide receivers, it seems like every couple of years they've kind of shuffled in guys. Yes, they signed MVS to originally a three year, $33 million deal, $11 million per. But it seems like they they got new guys stepping up every year, or they'll go out and get a veteran. Now they brought in Hollywood Brown, right? Or they'll go draft a guy. And then while well, you got Patrick Mahomes at quarterback, that age old phrase of the quarterback making the receivers. Helps when you got Travis Kelsey that takes a lot of pressure on that offense. So could we see a scenario where, going back to the question at hand, could we see a scenario where teams start to, I don't know if I want to say devalue wide receiver, because I don't think it's devalue wide receiver, but kind of play a little bit of money ball with, with their wide receivers. I guess if, if, if for me to answer that, depends. Every situation is going to be different because let's say for, for Green Bay's instance, for we'll just use Green Bay as an example here. If Christian Watson goes out and balls out this year, he stays healthy is the main thing, but he goes out, dude racks up 1,500 receiving yards, 15 touchdowns. I mean, just some insane numbers that like, okay, that's number one numbers. Are they going to let him go? Probably not. Or, or teams, you know, okay, let's let's use the Vikings, for instance. Justin Jefferson setting the world on fire. Would they just let him go? Probably not. Would they trade him? Maybe if they got a couple first round picks. I, I, I think every situation is going to be different. And I think with these numbers exploding, general managers and front office people have to be a little bit creative in how they build their teams. And they, and they can't just shell out money and try to quote unquote kick the can down the field ever, or down the road every single time. The Saints are notorious for doing that. It's going to catch up to them. They keep kicking it down. Other teams keep kicking it down. Or you got those teams that go all in, and then they're trying to fix their salary cap situation for for a couple of years here. I think if I if I were a general manager, or if, for my team, my favorite team, I I you got to look at this situation a little bit differently in a a case-by-case situation where, okay, you're paying a quarterback a ton of money, one of the highest-paid quarterbacks. You might have to make some tough decisions when it comes to positions like a wide receiver or a running back. You know, right now Green Bay's got the benefit of all their receivers and tight ends on rookie deals, and their quarterback's going to get a big deal. Enjoy it while it lasts. I mean, there might be – maybe they can – Get a couple guys as, as a bargain, re-sign a couple guys as a bargain. But, I, I, you know, the whole question about would you rather have your team play money ball, I don't think it's as easy as yes or no. You know what I mean? I, I, I don't think it's as easy as, yes, I want my team to do that. Because I think it depends on every situation. Minnesota, it makes complete sense to give Justin Jefferson a contract like that. One, the dude's a stud. The dude is an absolute stud. Two, you're going through a change at quarterback. Sam Darnold's probably going to be your initial star, but he isn't your long-term guy. It's going to be J.J. McCarthy, and he's going to be under a rookie deal. Those deals line up. They match up, just like how a rookie quarterback contract would line up You know, in other situations we've talked about. Other teams have tried doing that, right? They'll draft a quarterback, spend money elsewhere, try to take advantage of that rookie contract. That's what Minnesota's trying to do with it. Other teams may try, like Green Bay, okay? Jordan Love's going to have a big-time deal. You're taking advantage of rookie contracts at other positions. It's a case-by-case scenario. And that's where I would like, ideally, for my team's general manager or my teams to kind of look at this like, okay, you're going to have to make some tough decisions. It's not Monopoly money. We can't sit there and just pay everybody. It's not like you know we're the Dodgers or the Yankees and we can just shell out money and print money and, and keep everybody. Just make some smart football decisions, but you got to make the smart business decisions too. So to me, it's going to be interesting to watch in the next couple of years here 
after Love has that huge deal, if any of these wide receivers kind of really establish themselves as a number one, because if they really establish themselves as a number one, that means the payday goes up. Price tag's going to go up. If these if these guys kind of, you know, it's a it's an all-by-committee approach, they're still going to get paydays. They're still going to get, you know, decent contracts. Remember, MVS got $11 million per year, $33 million deal. And he was never a number one for Green Bay. Receivers are going to get paid if they show some glimpses, if they got the skill sets, if they're a big wide receiver with 4-3, four, 4-4 four, four speed out there. They're going to get paid. Somebody's going to pay them. But it's going to be really curious to see, you know, with this influx of, of talent here, because if you're going to pay quarterback and you're going to pay a wide receiver combo, you're going to have to take a hit elsewhere. And it seems like for a lot of years for Green Bay, maybe that hit was on defense. Defensive playmakers. Didn't trap well. Because if you're going to pay a lot of money to keep some of your guys around, you better, better, better draft well. And you better hope those rookies can contribute right away. And that's a credit to, to Kansas City. Kansas City has done it magically. They've almost done it perfectly. The last couple of years, back-to-back champions, they've paid a ton of money to their quarterback. They paid their tight end. They spent. They were able to give a guy like MVS, I'm not trying to pick on MVS, but they gave Marquez Valdez-Scantling a $33 million deal. But you know what? They took a hit on defense. They maybe weren't able to spend a whole lot. Yes, they did on Chandler Jones this year, but talk about a couple years ago. That defense, they drafted a lot of rookies and a lot of second-year guys played and started on that defense, and they were balling, and they still won a championship. They've won two in a row now because they've had rookies and young dudes stepping up, answering the call. So if you're a team that's going to invest, <clears throat> Dallas, potentially, or Cincinnati, in a lot of money in your quarterback-wide receiver combo, you better hope that you hit on some other picks. You better hope that your young guys, your rookies, are out there making plays, able to play day one, can't bring them along, can't store them on the depth chart and just play a few snaps here or there. That ain't going to work. Because if you're paying that quarterback and that wide receiver a lot of money right now, the expectation is to win right now. So it puts a lot of pressure on your front office, your scouting staff to get those picks right, but also the coaching staff to get those players ready to go. Kansas City is the model right now. Kansas City is the perfect model that you can pay a quarterback, you can pay a quarterback a big contract and still win a championship because they're winning in other areas. They're winning in the draft. They're winning in their development. They're winning in their coaching that's what separate. I mean, if I got a quarterback and I'm paying a quarterback a ton of money, I want that quarterback to be able to fill the gaps in other areas to make up for some deficiencies, whether that's from the wide receiver group or running back. Remember, like Kansas City like seems every couple of years that they just kind of go through different running backs, whether it's Clyde Edwards Hilaire, now it's Isaiah Pacheco, you know, they're every couple of years they're they're funneling in a new new running back. But they got Patrick Mahomes kind of filling in some of that gap, some of that space over there too. That's the luxury of having a, a franchise quarterback like Mahomes. So whether I want my team to play the money ball situation when it comes to you know, wide receivers, if you will. I think it's a case by case situation. I think it's a case by case situation. And I think there yes, there are certain quarterbacks that can make wide receivers look really good. I think Tom Brady was was another example. That part that system, that offensive system worked and he worked it to perfection. Also had a really good tight end and Rob Gronkowski there for for a while too, that helps. But I mean for for Carnot Law, when Chris Hogan for one year has a great year. I mean, it seemed like Bill Belichick was just trying to throw in whatever receivers out there for, for Brady, and Brady was getting the ball to him. Guess he had Edelman for a couple of years over there too. But Brady's another example of like, oh, we're going to give you different receivers. Work with it. Dink and dunk, king of the world. Don't matter. Dude's got seven championships. 
Let's take a quick break and switch gears here. We're going to talk a little Badgers with uh, Mr. R.J. Cardinal coming up after these quick words. Sweet, sweet summertime is here, Chippewa Valley, and it's time to load up on snacks and meals for the summer. Whether you're stocking up for the kids this summer, preparing for a cookout, or a long road trip, Hy-Vee in Eau Claire is your home for all of your summer food needs. From high-quality deli selections, a wide variety in the meat department, to the fantastic bakery and wine and spirits department, Hy-Vee has something for everyone to enjoy this summer. And don't forget to check out their team shop in case you're tailgating at a ball game this summer. Hy-Vee in Eau Claire, your summertime headquarters in the Chippewa Valley. All right, let's uh, bring him on in here. We've got Mr. R.J. Cardinal from the Zone in Madison joining us. And uh, R.J., I'm going to lead off with this. I uh, saw this last week. What are your thoughts about the Badgers and the Gophers battle for the axe on Black Friday instead of Saturday this year? I'm going to be in Madison anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really affect me. Uh, you know, it's uh, like for for what it is, it it puts you. I think it's the CBS game, mm-hmm. if uh, I'm not mistaken. So it puts you on national television. Uh, I mean, what's what's not to like about that? A national exposure game. Um, say what you will about it. Um, that's that's not when the game's supposed to be. I've seen people like all, all like all upset about that but i mean if if you can get national exposure i mean that's what it's really all about anyway like when you i i point to like the mac once the season gets rolling they are on wednesday through saturday you know um and they get nationally televised games because they take up time slots that the larger conferences don't or won't want to take and, uh, I mean, if you can get that, um, yeah, having the most played rivalry in uh, Division One college football uh, as a national game uh, on, on a Friday, uh, I'm absolutely okay with that. What would you say to those, though, who are maybe, I don't know if worried is the right word, or, or kind of questioning how the student section is going to look because, you know, Thanksgiving being the night before and, and maybe they're, a lot of the students are going to be out of town. Or would that be a, that much of a difference from a Friday to a Saturday? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure it would be much of a difference from a Friday to a Saturday. Um, you know, if, if they're going home, chances are they're not coming back Friday. Um, you know, and uh, the, the, usually you come back on that Saturday night or Sunday even. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it would be much of a change. It's really no different than Wisconsin basketball having – uh, home games over winter break. Uh-huh. Um, you know, the student section isn't going to be what it is. And uh, now this is just part of what the Big Ten does. Uh, I mean, they always used to finish their season before Thanksgiving uh, anyway, and now that you have a championship game that's the two weeks later, uh, they added a game over Thanksgiving weekend uh, to stay in with how the rest of college football was doing it and staying relevant for a week before uh, championship game week. Uh, so you just kind of have to roll with the punches there. It's It's been this way now for a couple of years. And, I mean, uh, sure, the student section wasn't full all those times, but, um, you know, they a lot of them sell their tickets anyway to try to make money off of them. So hopefully uh, you get some fans in there. I mean, It'll be interesting to see wh- how, who, why, what, where they can sell their student vouchers to. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so I'm not too sure. Or maybe it was decided that that game's not part of the student vouchers this year. I, I don't know that. I haven't looked that deep into it. But, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But uh, I think one way or another, the uh, student section probably wouldn't be as full as we would expect it to anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we don't have all the times for, for kickoff yet, right? No, but uh, apparently uh, NBC uh, like sources told uh, the Action Network that uh, Penn State and Oregon will both be uh, NBC primetime games, so 6 o'clock starts um, in October and uh, November, so... <laughs> There you go. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, possibly adding two more on there. 
I like so, yeah, so that gives us the first three. Okay. We have the Friday night uh, against Western Michigan at 8 p.m. Uh, then I think uh, South Dakota was a 2.30. Uh, then Alabama's the 11 o'clock. And then, yeah, then you go all the way to the end, Black Friday game. And then possibly, well, as it appears, uh, the Action Network was told two night games uh uh, in October and November. All right, interesting. Hey, uh, college football play or excuse me, college football Hall of Fame ballots uh, came out, and we do have a badger on there. Uh, running back Monte Ball uh, was listed as a is, as a finalist. Uh, when you think of Monte Ball's playing career, I mean, obviously we know a lot of great running backs to to come through come through Wisconsin and such, but what was it about Monte Ball that, that stands out the most to you or you remember the most? Uh, his consistency. Um, you know, he he wasn't one that he, – he, he's one of those guys who earned his playing time, you know. He was behind people and then became the back and had, um, what, seven – like he had 77 touchdowns in his career. That's pretty darn good. Yeah. Um, you know, and he had his whole campaign of the fall belonging to ball. Um, the one season had uh, 33 rushing touchdowns, uh, six receiving touchdowns, so almost 40 touchdowns in one year. Uh, that, that's pretty darn good. Um, but, uh, yeah, just overall consistency to being uh, where maybe if he would have gotten a couple more touches as a, as a freshman, you're looking at a guy who possibly could have been pushing for a 6,000-yard career, which, um, you know, if, if you're putting his numbers against some of the uh, quote-unquote Wisconsin greats, he's got to be up there with them. Um, he's part of that backfield in 2010 that almost had three 1,000-yard rushers, So, um, and he missed it by four yards. Um, but it, it's one of those, definitely a guy who... Um, I don't think he's in Wisconsin's Athletic Hall of Fame yet, but he will be. And I, I do think he's the kind of running back who uh, does deserve to be in the College Football Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. Uh, RJ, too, with uh, I don't, how much – I know how much you love preseason rankings. I mean, they're, they're, <laughs> they're, they're your number one thing. But when it comes to, uh, like, class ranks for, for like, uh, recruiting classes – how much do you pay attention, or how much do you take away for, from from those overall rankings? Because what I'm gonna what I'm gonna ask you, it seems like the 2025 class. I know they picked up a couple more recruits over there, and I've seen where they've ranked has been as high as like 15, maybe even 17 over there. But it seems like that 2025 class is getting a lot of love right now from their latest uh, latest commits. I, I will say this um, in terms of that Wisconsin has had a history of having a highly ranked class early on in the recruiting process. Um, And being the number 15th in the country is awesome, but uh, you still have a lot of five-star kids who aren't signed and they will end up signing at the, you know, the, the schools they always sign at. So Wisconsin, if they don't uh, bring any higher star kids in, will get passed up um, once, these high four and five star recruits start uh, committing to schools, but um, yeah, I mean it's to to people who want to say Wisconsin's recruiting is on an uptick. Uh, you're still looking at a class that has a majority of three stars and some four stars. So that recruiting hasn't changed. Uh, the type of recruit. Uh, in terms of build and all that that they're trying to put together here on the defensive side of the ball, especially when you look at these larger cornerbacks they're yeah. going after and the safeties that can come down and be absolute monsters and also play uh, linebacker. Um, we're seeing a difference there. Um, and then, I mean, they're still getting very highly rated running backs. Uh, you know, like you said, you just had uh, – um, oh, the oh, four-star O lineman. Um, oh, from Arizona. Yes, Logan Powell. Mm-hmm. Um, who, yeah, for out of three of the four recruiting rankings, he's a four-star, I think. Um, but so you're still getting uh, O linemen who at least are going to be projected to be very good. Um, 
whether or not we now have a coach who can develop them. It seems that hasn't happened in the past uh, few seasons here. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what you have happen there. And then, yeah, the other one, um, uh, a four-star, depending on where you look at it, uh, Rukeem Stroud, uh, yeah. uh, depending on where you look to, he's a DB or as Wisconsin, has, or not Wisconsin, but um, as a lot of uh, some places have said, he's a cornerback, um, and he's one of those bigger cornerbacks they're, they're going after uh, lately. So, yeah, uh, looking at a at a different style of recruit they're going after, and they think um, you, some of it can be looked at as better recruiting, but because of the teams that are also in on some of these guys. But uh, you also have to kind of look back through the history of some of the under-recruited and under-starred people Wisconsin did pick up along the way in their history of becoming a relevant name on the college football landscape, and they did a good job of finding the talent that nobody else did, much like the, the basketball team had been known to do. So um, until they start ending in the top 15 and pulling in these higher four-star and even more five-star recruits, like uh, they seem to have promised was going to start happening, um, uh, I'm, I'm not too sure we've seen an uptick in recruiting for Wisconsin. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the corners, and, and that's what I wanted to hit uh, touch on before I let you go here because I was reading uh, a little bit about Shroud there, and I was reading from uh, John McNamara from, from Badger Blitz, and I thought this was an interesting note. It says Luke Fickle and his staff have landed three four-star cornerbacks since taking over at Wisconsin in 2023. And I know Luke Fickle's got a defensive background, but I, I, I feel like if, if Luke Fickle is really targeting a corner – or, or that position, I mean, I, I get a little excited because there's one guy he had in Cincinnati that's pretty darn good right now, and that's Sauce Gardner, and that's a bigger corner, too, over there. I mean, it yeah. seems like Luke Fickle knows corners. I know it's just one, but that's a pretty darn good corner over there. Oh, absolutely, and, and I mean, that's the kind of guy they're looking for. Um, the at least six foot who is able to uh, – be in stride with those bigger wide receivers, being able to jump with those bigger wide receivers um, in a league and not just, I mean, we've seen the NFL go towards it, but uh, in college football where the spread and air rate are becoming more and more prevalent um, and not just a fad um, and, a, and a defense that it'll be interesting to see if they ever go to a full three, three, five. Um, but uh yeah, they're they're definitely looking to be able to put uh, a very diverse defensive backfield in there uh, to complement. Uh, well, hopefully, complement eventually a front six, front seven. Because um, right now, I mean, you're really uh, at a lack when you're looking at that defensive line uh, still, and um, it seems like uh, hopefully this new D line coach will you know, put some enthusiasm into some guys. They they seem to like him when they're on their recruiting trips. Uh, just haven't said yes to him yet. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, de definitely these these cornerbacks they're going after are uh, hopefully, I mean, it'd be nice to say you find a sauce gardener again, but right. hopefully they're those the kind of guy, at least, that is the athletic kind of guy, plays both sides of the field, maybe can even – Stay in and defend the run, um, but you know it's it's a more uh, broadened uh, cornerback rather than a you're a cornerback mm -hmm. kind of player. Like uh, they have a rover in there. I mean, I know that's usually a safety, but um, it seems like they're looking for guys who can play safety and or corner. Because I got to imagine, and, you know, another one there too. Uh, is it uh, Jameer Scott, uh, twenty twenty five class? Uh, I think is a defense back corner on there too. But I mean, yep. if Luke Fickle goes on these trips with, with these corners, he's got to bring up, "Hey, I coached Sauce Gardner in college, right?" I mean, I would. <laughs> you know, if I'm a corner, I would. Absolutely, and same with uh, um, uh, defensive coordinator. Why am I blanking on? Oh, Tressel. Yeah, thank you. Wow. <laughs> I mean, that that's one that's like, hey, I schemed for Sauce Gardner. I got him, well, honestly, he's the one who got himself drafted. But, I mean, we made him a focal point, and he did great. And let's we can do that for you, too. I mean, that's not something you just 
because you're not at Cincinnati anymore, you think, nah, well, that's mm-hmm. not us anymore. Right. You know, um, and what it's uh, like, like you said, he's the fifth DB uh, recruit since they got here. Um, and yeah, it'll be interesting to see what that room is going to look like as, as things move forward. Because, uh, you know, here at Wisconsin, we haven't always had the, the larger uh, defensive backs. It's been the hard hitters, the smart players, the guys who can put themselves in a position to be um, great football players. Now you're adding athleticism to that um, and, and size to, to those attributes that Wisconsin has traditionally had. Um, it'll be interesting to see what kind of play you get out of your defensive backfield as, as this defense uh, maturates and moves forward. Absolutely. R.J. Cardinal, dude, as always, we appreciate uh, your insight and your input, man. Uh, enjoy the rest of the week here, and uh, we'll catch up with you again soon, okay, buddy? Sounds good. We will talk to you later. You got it. There you go, R.J. Cardinal. Good stuff, breaking down some badger football. And and that is going to do it for us on this episode of the Man Cave Podcast, brought to you by hy V and Toyson Ford. Don't forget to check out Swag Cave, done by our good friends from Resonance Branding Company as well. That link is in the podcast description. Until next time, I'm Dan Casper, and I will talk to you on the next episode of the Man Cave Podcast.